Department of Landscape Architecture for the last 15 minutes here, and it's been really my, my privilege uh, to join the faculty here last year. Um, and I'm very pleased to be able to, uh, to welcome you all uh, this morning. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Um, I thought I would say a few words just to situate um, this event, uh, which um, has already and will very quickly again speak for itself, in the context of the school and the department and some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the kind of intellectual aspirations uh, that, that we share. Um, my appointment last year was one of uh, what's now 10 new faculty uh, in a relatively small, uh, obscure Department of Landscape Architecture. Uh, and if you were here um, last night, you heard this in the commitment of our dean, uh, Moisen Mostafavi, uh, and the support of uh, President Drew Faust and the leadership of the university to reinvest um, in landscape architecture. I think um, certainly I share uh, Moisen and, and Drew's sense that uh, landscape architecture has never been more relevant uh, to the kinds of social and environmental challenges that we face. And it's, it's also, at least in my career, never been more uh, central to questions relative to uh, the design disciplines and the professions that we profess here uh, in the GSD. Um, in that context, um, those kinds of commitments, particularly in this economic climate over the last two years, uh, indicated to me the level of seriousness with which the university and the GSD was taking uh, the investment uh, in landscape architecture. Um, and at the same moment, uh, it's been clear to me um, that we have, I think, an unprecedented opportunity to grow and expand um, the number uh, of our graduates to respond to what's increasingly a global set of uh, demands on them. <clears throat> Over the last couple of years, we've been producing between 30 and 32 uh, landscape architects a year on average uh, into a global marketplace. In a typical year, uh, the top quarter or the top third might go directly into the practices of our faculty very happily. And so we end up producing 20 to 24 globally. Eight, let's say, go to Asia. Eight for North America. Eight for the rest of the world. Not to mention a few who go off into teaching or research or, or other engagements. Um, I got a call last week from a firm on the West Coast who was looking to interview our top 10 in June. And so what's clear is the kind of university and the school's commitment to reinvesting in and in growing landscape architecture, our capacity to respond to these opportunities um, suggests that we in fact should grow and we are we're committed to growing the scale and scope of our, of our numbers over uh, the next couple of years by about 50%. Um, in, in that context, um, it's been true for some time that overwhelmingly the majority of our applicants and the majority of our students and graduates are women. Two-thirds is a kind of industry average. That's no longer news. It's been that way for over a decade. In my previous role at the University of Toronto, that was clear. I know it's true at the University of Pennsylvania, Virginia, Berkeley, and other uh, peer institutions. Um, what's interesting, I think, and it's something that Moisen alluded to last night, is that this is increasingly true across the design fields. That is, landscape was kind of in the avant-garde in that regard, but increasingly the GSD is skewing in this direction, uh, as are other disciplines in certain aspects across the, the university. Um, in this regard, of course, and again, as Moisen mentioned last night, um, I think we have many, many challenges. While we're producing fantastic leadership, uh, many of whom are women for the future of these fields, um, it is also true that at various points in their career path, I think we have to take a more active role in constructing the conditions for practice uh, going forward. That's a conversation that's ongoing here in the school, not just about questions of gender, but around a whole range of questions of, of, uh, questions of identity uh, more generally. Um, but of course, as uh, Thaisa Wei uh, reminded us last night, of course, women have always occupied positions of leadership in the practice of landscape architecture. Uh, it's simply, at least in her view, that our histories have been constructed otherwise. And that's a part of why we thought this would be an interesting event to, uh, to convene. Um, certainly, the, the GSD and the Department of Landscape architecture are committed to building our capacity for historical inquiry. Uh, it's certainly true that the school and the department have benefited from ex some extraordinary historians. Um, our very own John Beardsley uh, among them, uh, Mark Laird, uh, America Benish, Dorothea Imbert over the recent past. Um, having said that, we also have now uh, launched a series of colloquia. This is the second in a, in a series that we hope will be annual, uh, focusing specifically on questions of landscape history. And we've launched a search to hire a full-time member of faculty to join us uh, hopefully next year. Um, in that context, um, today's event is really one modest step in an overall uh, strategic goal of uh, reintegrating 
animating histories and theories of landscape architecture to the life of the department. Um, and in that regard, um, I was very, very pleased when I proposed that this is a topic that I knew very little about but would like to learn more about, that John agreed that it would be something he'd be interested to take up. So thank you, John, for doing this and with such poise and aplomb and some, such acumen. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the members of the team behind the scenes that you've been dealing with, with Brooke King and Doug Cogger and everyone in the front office of the department and in the school for organizing uh, the events. And of course, uh, to all of you who have joined us today and our speakers in particular, those that have traveled such great distance. It's such a lovely moment this morning to see uh, Rosa and Cornelia uh, and Carol and all the other uh, speakers and guests that have joined us. So thank you all for being here. Look forward to today. Thank you, Charles, and uh, my welcome to all of you, too. And Charles very, uh, very aptly pointed out that this isn't just about the past of landscape architecture, but also about its present and its future, that we're going back to excavate some of the lost narratives of modernism, but, uh, but in a, in, with the intent of illuminating the current situation of practice and, uh, and, and helping to propel it forward. Um, uh, you all have a program. And there are extensive, well, there are brief biographies of each of the speakers on here, so um, uh, I, I, I will we'll dispense with extensive uh, introductions. Uh, the first speaker today is Sonia Dumpelman, who teaches at the University of Maryland. I'm also pleased to say she's currently a Garden and Landscape Studies Fellow at Dumbarton Oaks, where she's working on a book, Flights of Imagination, Aviation and Innovation in 20th Century Landscape Design and Planning. She's also studied extensively the, uh, the history of landscape architecture in Europe after the war, uh, generated in part by her work on Maria Teresa Parpaglio, Parpagliolo Shepherd uh, and landscape architecture in Italy. Uh, in, in fascist Italy. So we'll start today with uh, Sonia Dumpelman presenting uh, the context of landscape architecture and women uh, after the Second World War in Europe. Sonia. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for hosting the symposium. Thank you, um, John, for organizing, and uh, also everybody else who was uh, involved in the organization. Um, and also, thank, thank you, Taisa, where, where is she? Uh, for setting the stage uh, so beautifully yesterday evening. And I think that uh, many of us will probably uh, tie into uh, your presentation or what you were saying yesterday um, in our presentations today. Okay, so at the opening of the first International Conference of Landscape Architecture held in London in 1948, and which led to the foundation of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, a proposal um, by the British landscape architect Marjorie Allen, um, whom you see here. Um, eight landscape architects sat on the podium, four men and four women. This gender equality did not, however, reflect the true percentage of women and men in the profession at the time. Women were and still are in the minority. Neither did it influence subsequent histori historiographies in which women have been largely neglected, as we heard um, yesterday. However, it does attest to the fact that the still relatively young profession of landscape architecture at the time provi provided women with an opportunity to enter the professional world despite discrimination and doubts on the part of many of their male colleagues. As Taisa Wei has shown, women can be portrayed as, I'm quoting her, a force in landscape architecture, playing an active role in the profession's development rather than as, a passive, as passive professionals who are helplessly subject to men. In fact, as Madsen on Furlong pointed out in 1994, garden and landscape architecture has also been a tool for women's emancipation. Amongst the women at the London conference were the English landscape designer Sylvia Crow, um, who had chaired the organizing committee, and also her Italian colleague Maria, Maria Teresa Papagliolo Shepherd, whom you see here, who participated in the meeting in a variety of functions, including that of translating, organizing the exhibition, and leading some of the conference tours. Not present at the venue was the third European landscape architect whom I'm going to treat in this paper, uh, the German landscape designer Hertha Hammerbacher. Like all her German colleagues, she was excluded from participation at the conference due to Germany's transgressions during World War II. 
The three women had many things in common. They were of the same generation, born at the beginning of the 20th century into the liberal middle-class families. While their mothers had provided them with independent progressive female role models, they found male mentors to introduce them to their prospective careers as landscape architects. Um, we're talking about the women, so they can be bigger this time. Um, they began their professional education at, um, so the three women began their professional education at horticultural colleges in, in the cases um, of Hammerbacher and Crow, but due to the lack of such colleges in Italy, um, Papagliolo learned about botany and plants on her own. Their first works as landscape architects were closely related to the domestic sphere, focusing on planting and private house garden designs. They were also prolific writers on a variety of subjects that included planting and garden design and later city planning and broader environmental issues. Hammerbacher, Crow, and Papagliolo represent a group of independent prof professional women who by the post-war years had established themselves and had gained a high profile in their respective countries, if not internationally. They actively seized the new opportunities the profession offered in the post-war years, and this meant they became involved in a variety of large-scale projects as landscape architects and consultants. While Howard and Way have observed for the United States that, quote, feminine visibility in the profession declined radically in the war and post-war years, the women discussed here seized the new, op new possibilities the profession offered after World War II and held representative, influential, and visible positions. In fact, in 1946, Sylvia Crow, together with her colleague Brenda Colvin, successfully argued against the merging of the Institute of Landscape Architects with the Royal Institute of British Architects. Having approached the field from its horticultural side rather than from architecture, as many of their male colleagues, Crow and Colvin were perhaps more able and more interested in seeing and maintaining a division between the two disciplines. Crow received various honors for her work and in 1969 was elected the first woman president of IFLA, the International Federation of Landscape Architects. Hammerbacher became the first woman professor of landscape architecture at a German university and Papagliolo collaborated with Pietro Pacinai in an attempt to found a school for landscape architecture, a first step that smoothed the way for the organization of a qualified and professional landscape architecture practice in Italy. Not uncharacteristically for professionals of their generation, Hammerbacher, Crow, and Papagliolo embraced modernist agendas while remaining grounded in the past. The women achieved this grounding literally by their interest in garden history on the one hand and in planting design on the other hand. And while all three women used their plant knowledge extensively, they also pushed the profession's boundaries by engaging in large-scale design and planning projects. They can therefore be described as figures of transition, uh, working on a variety of scales. Their designs were works of th synthesis that sought to elevate and promote the profession while at the same time firmly grounding it in its tradition. Creating a synthesis out of house and garden, landscape and city was the conceptual approach used by Hertha Hammerbacher throughout her career. Born in 1900, she studied at the Höhere Lehr- and Forschungsanstalt um, für Gartenbau, which is a horticultural training um, school in Berlin, Dahlem, from 1924 to 1926. Hammerbacher's um, subsequent work as a young landscape architect leading up to and through the years of World War II predominantly involved house garden designs, such as this one. In the years 1935 to 48, she worked in partnership with her first husband, Hermann Matern, and the plant breeder, Karl Förster, developing the design principles that would guide the small and large-scale designs she produced throughout her career. Herbaceous plants and shrubs, as well as ground modulation using S-curves, were used to make space and to establish connections between house and garden into the surrounding landscape. Um, uh, uh, house and garden into the surrounding landscape um, that was later paralleled by the idea of merging landscape and city. 
Although being a woman prevented her from participating in the motorway projects promoted by the Nazi regime, a prestigious, well-paid, and secure job, she engaged in other projects for the regime that led her to work in distant locations and on larger scales during the World War II years. Um, the projects included work commissioned by the Nazi Operation Tod, like the landscape planning for war worker housing. I'm showing you an example here. Um, for the, this uh, project was done for towns in the occupied territories in Poland. Despite her involvement with commissions for the regime, in 1906, uh, 1946, she became a lecturer in landscape and garden design at the Department of Architecture and Urban Planning at the Technical University Berlin. And in 1950, she was the first German woman to hold a professorship in the field and at the Technical University Berlin. Teaching architecture and urban planning students the principles of garden architecture and landscape planning enhanced her own interest in broader urban planning issues. She had developed the principle of merging the landscape with architecture on the small, intimate scale of her early house garden designs, and in the, post and, uh, in the war and post-war years, began to apply it to her urban designs and plans. In the latter case, using many of the ideas that had been promoted and further developed by urban planners and architects working for the Nazi regime. The so-called city landscape, Stadtlandschaft in German, a paradigm coined and developed in the 1920s by the geographer Siegfried Passage, had first been used by German urban planners in 1929 and had been elaborated on by planners under the Nazi regime. It influenced Hammerbacher's holistic and organic approach to city building in which landscape was supposed to form a unified whole with the urban fabric while at the same time ordering and structuring it. Like her garden designs, Hammerbacher's urban designs were guided by the idea of a harmonious relationship between humans and non-human nature. Housing and urban fabric were to be embedded in and framed by green open space. A self-serving argument accompanied this design concept, described and promoted by Hammerbacher as, quote, urban planning related to landscape, or landschaftsbezogene Bauplanung. She argued that due to its focus on the landscape, landscape architects were to be involved in the urban planning process from the beginning. As Jung Hiri has pointed out in her dissertation, Hammerbacher's work and argumentation did indeed lead to the inclusion of landscape planning in the first West German federal building law of 1957. As faculty member at the Technical University Berlin, Hammerbacher quickly became involved in reconstruction planning for Berlin. One of the most prestigious and internationally acclaimed projects was the International Building Exhibition Interbau that opened in 1957 on a 44-acre site, the old Hansaviertel, adjacent to the northwestern part of Tiergarten, uh, Berlin's big central park. The Interbau was intended to tackle current urban planning and housing questions and to provide models for technically and architecturally advanced construction. Um, flowing green open space was to form a backbone and ordering structure of the Hansa Viertel and was to connect the neighborhood with the surrounding landscape, in particular with the Tiergarten, um, which is you can only see parts um, of the Tiergarten here in this image. Um, Hammerbacher was one of seven German and of altogether um, 12 landscape architects involved in the project. As the only woman, she chose to team up with the Swedish female garden architect Inge Wettborn. Uh, when Wettborn declined participation, Hammerbacher was paired up with the Swede Edvard Jakobsen, a collaboration that did not work so well, <clears throat> so that they divided tasks. Um, and Hammerbacher designed, um, you know, broadly, most of the area that you see indicated here in yellow. She designed the Hansaplatz, the plaza in front of the St. Ansgar Church, and the open spaces surrounding the house designed by Oskar Niemeyer, um, which is located here. 
She also developed an iconic um, paving design using cement and granite slabs and um, little um, mosaic pavers that connected all open spaces assigned to her and Jakobsen and that subsequently became one of her signature design features. Um, and I hope you can see that um, cl more clearly than I can from the side here, but uh, those um, Paving patterns are indicated here in, in this plan, and then this, of course, is the overall landscape plan that she drew up. Although the paving was, of course, not natural green open space, conceptually it unified the residential neighborhood by flowing through it. Um, the paving's <clears throat> irregular edges also blended with lawns and other green open spaces so that the open space system as a whole became a structuring device as intended by the overall open space scheme for Hansaviertel. Um, Hammerbacher established further connections between the new neighborhood and Tiergarten by planting groups of deciduous trees irregularly and modulating, um, modulating the grounds in a way that made them seem to have belonged to this big park area in the first place. While Hammerbacher's ideas gained a new impulse through her visit to Japan on the occasion of the 1964 IFLA conference held in Tokyo, she saw her existing garden and urban design ideas confirmed. In Japan, she wrote after the conference, new urban plans were based on regional and local landscape features, and garden designs formed a unity with adjacent buildings. At the same time, she was impressed with the work of the metabolists, a group of architects led by Kenzo Tange, who devised plans for dense vertical urban landscapes. Still under this impression, in 1966, she participated together with a group of young architects, amongst them her daughter Mariette Matern, in the competition for an urban design for Ratingen West, West 50 kilometers north of Cologne. The design merged Hammerbacher's old ideas regarding the city landscape with new visionary ideas exemplified by the work of the metabolists. A central green open space was surrounded by vertical terraced housing blocks that tapered down towards areas of single family houses in the outskirts of the neighborhood. Fittingly, Hammerbacher described the design as both built landscape and landscape as built form. With this, she acknowledged for the first time that the city landscape could also be determined by architectural built form instead of only by open space. As Yeung Heiri has no noted, the Japanese experience therefore not only induced Hammerbacher to distance herself from the so-called structured and dispersed city concept, which was a, um, an urban uh, planning paradigm in Germany at the time, uh, and that was based on the dispersal of low-density housing and was supported by many post-war architects and planners, but it also made her realize that technology did not only harm the environment, but could also be used to benefit an environmentally conscious society. In a general climate of anxiety revolving around uncontrolled urban growth and the proliferation of new technologies, Sylvia Crow became the leading landscape architect in Britain dealing with what she called the landscape of power and roads. How to insert roads and buildings of modern industry, the result of technological advancement like nuclear power plants, transformer stations, power lines, wires, reservoirs, and airfields into the landscape was one of the concerns that guided her post-war work. Born in 1901 and educated at Swanley Horticultural College from 1920 to 1922, Crow, like Hammerbacher and Papaliolo, first worked for a tree nursery. Um, immediately after World War II, she opened her own practice in London, profiting from office space given to her by Brenda Colvin and commissions handed on to her by Jeffrey Jellicoe. Crow embarked on a rapid national and international career. In 1948, she became the first honorary secretary of the newly founded IFLA. She was elected vice president in 1953 and the first woman president of IFLA in 1969. In 1988, she received the American Society of Landscape Architects medal and she was also the most prolific writer of the three women discussed here. In the four years between 1956 and 1960 alone, she published four books, amongst them The Landscape of Power and The Landscape of Roads. 
Um, she also published uh, a number of articles that influenced uh, the work of her, her peers, um, of government officials and industrialists in Britain. The realization that new technologies and industries directly or indirectly determined the function and visual appearance of the national landscape and the livelihood of the entire nation led her to embrace national planning issues, including large industrial and infrastructure projects. She began to tackle the, quote, problem of absorbing the machine scale into the human scale landscape and also of finding, quote, the synthesis between the technological and the organic natural worlds. Crow believed that the landscape had to, quote, reflect the growing mechanization of the economy and the increased mobility of the population, but that it also had to be designed and planned to protect human and environmental health. Her agenda was determined by the idea that the buildings and structures of new industries like nuclear power, communication, and transportation, fascinating cosmic shapes, as she called them, needed to be assimilated into the landscape by preserving and redesigning, where necessary, the entire surface cover of the land into one flowing comprehensive pattern, as she suggested. Several of her designs illustrate how power and transformer stations, in this case um, that you see here, could unobstru unobstrusively be integrated into the existing landscape pattern. Crow compared the patterns of the landscapes of power and roads with abstract modern art, and in particular with Paul Klee's composition of arrows and interpenetrating lines. The interlocking shapes and lines of abstract art had so far on only been translated into garden designs, for example by Thomas Church in California. Crow aimed at using patterns of interlocking shape, as she called them, to transform entire landscapes. Besides the pattern from the air, building masses and forms also had to blend into the landscape from the ground view, and the new roads needed to offer drivers attractive views. For example, planting, siting, and excavating could be used to screen transformer stations and make them appear as if they sprung from the earth. True to the British landscape, Crow promoted the adoption of the 18th century haha -ha to blend buildings with the landscape contours. This is, she argued, a useful device when the building requires the appearance of rising cleanly from the, op the open ground while the landscape sweeping up to it without planting, or with the, I'm sorry, with the landscape sweeping up to it without planting or walls. Amongst the design principles Crow embraced in her post-war war work were the, dis the disruption and breaking up of clear edges, forms, and silhouettes of large buildings through plantings and landforms, the use of color that matched buildings to their surroundings, and roads and fences running parallel to contour lines. According to Crow, the organic pattern of the rural surroundings should impose itself on the industrial plant. Um, Tras Winneth, um, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this Welsh <coughs> name correctly, uh, the fourth nuclear power station of Britain's 1955 nuclear power pre uh, program, whose construction was begun in 1959 in Welsh Snowdonia, was one of the sites where Crow, um, employed as landscape consultant, strove to achieve, quote, a direct union between the main buildings and the surrounding Welsh mountain landscape by carrying the wild landscape right up to the structures. There, she could also use design principles she had developed for and used in road and forestry projects. The station's pump house was sunk below ground level and the approach road that you see here was unlit, uncurbed, and laid out along the contours. The plant's um, substation, um, you can see that little uh, green circle, was sited on low ground and its surface partly sown with dwarf clover to break up the great expanse of hard surface as seen from higher viewpoints. Ground modeling was used to merge the buildings with the surrounding landforms. For example, the ground between the turbine house and the substation that I've indicated here was modeled so as to appear as a spur of the surrounding hills. Small existing woods on hillsides were enlarged by forestry planting that could screen and absorb the buildings. At the northeast corner of the substation, tree-planted mounds were built to conceal parts of the power station from the road. 
Besides blending industry and roads into the landscape, Crow was also engaged in projects that involved integrating human habitation with landscape and designed green open space. In 1947, she was appointed to develop the landscape proposals for Harlow Newtown in Essex, collaborating with the town's planner, uh, Frederick Gibbert. She was a consultant until 1973. Like many of her British colleagues, she profited from the opportunity that Lord Reith, chairman of the New Towns Committee in 1945 to 1946, had created by determining that each of the post-war New Towns had to have a landscape architect on the design team from the outset. Like her German colleague Hammerbacher, Crow followed an urban paradigm that was based on the idea of landscape and green open space as structuring elements. In Harlow, existing natural features like valleys, brooks, woods, and clumps of trees, um, in this case, um, if you observe this area here, um, were um, used to forge identity, and so, so that, that's one of the reasons um, that was put forth uh, for their preservation. And they were also used as so-called pegs, um, as Crow liked to say, on which the design is hung. As stated in the 1952 planning proposals report, the town design was to have its own existence as landscape and was to weld landscape and building groups into a coherent whole. The countryside in the form of green wedges of forest meadows and streams running along, along the valleys that intersect the area was to both physically and visually flow through the town, providing both boundaries and connectors between the different neighborhoods and their surroundings, and also space for paths as well as for recreational amenities and schools in the neighborhood centers. Crow envisioned that inhabitants could in this way be drawn to, to enjoy nature and the countryside more easily. Her work at Hollow also involved detailed open space designs for industry and neighborhoods, including play spaces and other recreational areas. She supported the idea of separating um, traffic system systems that led to the conversion of old lanes into pedestrian and bicycle paths connecting neighborhoods designed by different architects for individual character. The British new towns were influential in urban planning uh, in a number of countries, including Italy, and um, the Italian exponent that I'm going to talk about, Maria Teresa Papagliolo Shepherd, who had begun her career as landscape architect in the, in the 1930s in Rome, had already worked on urban planning schemes during the fascist period. In 1940, she had been appointed to head the planning department of Parks and Gardens of the World Exhibition um, site south of the city, planned by Mussolini to open in 1942. Serving the fascist regime, she adhered to its political vision with her theoretical statements and design work for the exhibition, and yet she showed no regret and no lack of self-confidence when reflecting in 1971 on her work within the male-dominated planning team. Quote, it was such an enormous job that I learned the profession doing one job and teaching all the architects to see the site in a different way. Although she was hired for the job because of her excellent botanical know-how and her ability to design planting plants and flower beds, Papagliolo realized the new opportunities it offered for becoming involved in urban design and planning. After her marriage to the Englishman Ronald Shepherd in 1946, Papagliolo began to work in England um, and there acting as the landscape architect Frank Clark's deputy when in 1948 he started to work as landscape consultant to the festival office of the Festival of Britain, she again ventured into the realms of urban design and planning. Celebrating the centenary of the first world exhibition and the nation's recovery after the war, the festival was also supposed to promote modern design in all fields. In contrast to the world's exhibition grounds of the previous 100 years that had been organized around central axes, the festi uh, uh, around central axes and um, dominated by symmetry, um, the festival grounds were to be experienced along a meandering pathway that you see on the bottom image here. Uh, the grounds had in fact been conceived as a model for modern townscape grounded in the nation's honorable past by realizing 
I'm quoting, in urban terms, the principles of the picturesque. Um, this was believed to be achieved through the skillful incorporation of already existing buildings into the scene, the use of water to provide an invisible but effective barrier, carefully contrived alternations of concealment and disclosure, studied changes of level and of surface, contrasts between apparent enclosure and sudden glimpses of far distance. In addition to the preparation, organization, and surveillance of the plantings, Papaliolo was responsible for the design of several plant containers and open spaces on the exhibition grounds on London's South Bank. In her and Clark's design for the Regatta Restaurant Garden, they adopted the design language influenced by mole mole molecular science and crystallography that, in keeping with the exhibition's theme, the fusion of art and science, had guided Misha Black and Alexander Gibson's architecture of the building. In 1954, Papagliolo accepted a position as landscape architect for one of the leading Italian real estate and building companies, the Società Generale Immobiliare, uh, to provide the company with open space and garden designs, as well as planting plans for its new housing developments and residential developments in and outside Rome. This is the same company that um, for us as American audience um, here, uh, also designed uh, or was in charge of the Watergate complex in, in Washington, DC. Um, thus, while Hammerbacher and Crow were producing plans and designs for the Hansaviertel and Harlow respectively, Papa Lulo worked on the landscape plans for new residential neighborhoods in and around Rome. Her international experience and familiarity with Anglo-American and North European landscapes, including parkways and community gardens, made her a suitable candidate for the company's projects. At the Roman garden suburb Casal Palocco, located 10 kilometers southwest of Rome, Papaliolo produced the plans for the parkway, public and communal open spaces, besides a number of private gardens. The plan drawn up for Casal Palocco during the post-war reconstruction period by the architects Emilio Piferi, Alberto Ressa, Alberto Libera, Ugo Lucicenti, Mario Paniconi, Giulio Pediconi, and Giuseppe Vaccaro, uh, was inspired by American suburbs that some um, Sociedad Generale executives had visited during a trip to the United States. The plan envisioned a settlement for 15,000 middle-class inhabitants that provided ample green open space, including sports grounds and a social community fostered by a commercial, religious, and community center. Casal Palocco was to provide a healthy alternative to living in what was then considered to be the congested, polluted, and anonymous city of Rome, and new opportunities for home ownership for the young middle class aspiring to an American way of life that emphasized leisure, rela relaxation, and freedom from conventions. The suburban plan was structured into subdivisions made accessible by a curved ring road designed as a parkway. I've indicated that in black here. Um, throughout the suburb, described recently by Bruno Bonomi as an American model of modernity, Papagliolo used vegetation that was typical of the region and in particular of the Mediterranean um, macchia, so uh, vegetation formation typical of the um, uh, Medi Mediterranean coastline. She chose different tree and shrub species for each neighborhood. Specific species like orange and olive trees and laurel acted as signifiers providing the subdivisions with a name and identity. Planting beds incorporated into sidewalks ran alongside the roads and properties were divided by hedges instead of by fences and walls so to substantiate the green effect of the new town. Papaliolo tried to increase the naturalistic effect by loose and informal shrub and tree plantings, by the scattered planting of narcissus, and by letting pathways develop along desire lines in the central strip of the parkway. She also designed the communal gardens within the individual subdivisions that provided spaces for different structured and unstructured play, sports, and leisure activities. Papagliolo, Crow, and Hammerbacher sought to shape cities through landscape architecture at a time when the associate editor of the American journal Landscape Architecture, Grady Clay, disregarded women entirely 
listen carefully what he had to say. Clay observed in his 1958 editorial entitled Shapely Women and Cities, what's the urban equivalent of 382434, that quote, more men than ever before are working to shape our urban landscape according to principles of design. Comparing the formal and aesthetic qualities of the city to the normative figures used to describe the beauty of the ideal female body, he noted, quote, few influences more subtly repel our advances or more surely arouse us than the spatial qualities of our cities, end of quote. The classical ideal of the dolce utili, the co combination of the beautiful and useful, in turn underlay the work of Hammerbacher, Crow, and Papagliolo. They were humanists at heart, trying with their designs to achieve both beautiful and functional landscapes, or as Crow put it, in an aesthetic expression of practical land use. They sought to produce what their slightly older peer, Brenda Colvin, described as designs that were contemporary, individual, and true to the needs of humanity, thereby negating the modernist notion of the separation of functions and instead embracing synthesis as a design principle, for example, in their concepts to merge city and landscape. While acknowledging the profession's tradition, their designs responded to the new opportunities, requirements, and conditions in the post-war years. The use of new plant cultivars, abstract forms and shapes, the attention to creating flowing space accessible and enjoyable to the greatest possible number of people determine many of their designs. After her visit to Japan in 1964, Papagliolo appealed for a spiritual understanding and a sensitive use of the land, paying attention to the environmental resources, including flora and fauna, a concern she, she shared with Hammerbacher and Crow. Having broken out of the domestic sphere and working in the public realm and with the ability to master micro and macro scales in their work, these women assumed responsibility both for the appearance and the function of the land in their countries, often arguing vehemently for environmental protection. This interest, as well as their concerns for landscape planning on regional and national levels, reflect their times and shows they did not stand in their male colleagues' shadows, even though on occasion they had to assume strategies to stand and hold their ground, and although they made sacrifices in their private lives. All three women played a substantial role in the establishment and recognition of landscape architectural practice in their home countries, in particular after World War II. Their expertise led them to become nationally known and sought after figures in the cases of Hammerbacher and Papagliolo and a person of international renown in the case of Crow. The realization that landscape architecture was both an art and a science and therefore suitable to bridge the gap between the two was perceived particularly strongly again in the post-war years and guided the women in much of their work. Thus, it was only a logical consequence that all three, like many of their male and female colleagues, would play mediating roles. As Crow put it in her presidential ad address to the British Institute of Landscape Architects in 1957, landscape architecture's function was to, quote, translate all the diverse and sectional interests of different land users into one complete and healthy landscape. Theirs was a work of th synthesis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. That's terrific. I think Sonia has demonstrated effectively what Taisik said last night, which is that women weren't missing from practice, they're missing from our histories. Uh, and, and that the practice that they pursued in Europe, uh, just as the practices that uh, Taisa spoke about last night, spanned an, an amazing range of work uh, from horticulture to community planning. We got started a little late and we're running a little behind, so I think I'll suggest that we hold questions. Uh, we'll have a break, we'll have another talk now by Kelly Comras, and then a break, and we might have some time for some questions before the break. Um, Kelly Comras is going to, we're gonna s jump continents now, um, and also uh, jump from a sort of thematic presentation to one that's more focused on a, on a particular uh, individual. Uh, Kelly Comras is gonna talk to us about Ruth Shellhorn, uh, who was, uh, developed a very active commercial practice in Southern California after the Second World War. Uh, Kelly is both an, an attorney and a landscape architect. 
uh, went to law school and design school. Uh, she is a, a landscape architect in practice in Pacific Palisade. She's also worked for the National Park Service. Uh, she's done uh, historic landscape studies, uh, one on a 20s landscape in Southern California, Castel Amare, uh, funded by the J. Paul Getty Trust. And she's working on a book on Ruth Schellhorn. So please welcome Kelly Comres. You know how this works. Show forward, me. back, and the pointer. forward, back, and there's a pointer yeah, okay. right there. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you for having me here, and uh, Taeza, I want to thank you for thinking of me and John for inviting me. And um, yes, it's true that uh, the history sometimes gets lost. I feel that um, Ruth Shellhorn's work was very prominent in Southern California, but through a fluke of luck, her papers and she were located before she passed away, and I had an opportunity to interview her for two years before she died. So um, let's get started. Uh, the subject of my talk today is about the mid-century development of a modern landscape design aesthetic that came to be known as the Southern California look. These were modern landscapes often set against the clean lines of contemporary architecture or the spare adaptations of Spanish-style structures. They utilized bold forms and exotic, profusely flowering plant material to evoke a leisurely, sun-soaked lifestyle. The Southern California look grew out of a post-World War II way of life that followed the exuberant mood of the times. It was a visual manifestation of our opportunity to enjoy a newfound leisure and prosperity in the out of doors. Unlike the old formalism, it was free-flowing, relaxed, and casual. I want to show you today the distinctive contribution to that aesthetic made by the landscape architect Ruth Shellhorn. She didn't invent the Southern California look, but she was one of its innovators and best practitioners. During her 57-year practice, from 1933 to 1990, her name became closely associated with this developing regional identity. She helped define the sun-drenched landscape of mid-century Southern California, and over time, it became her signature style. In what follows, I will show you her individual role that she played in developing the Southern California look. I wanted to mention, too, that she had graduated from Cornell with a degree in both architecture and landscape architecture, and I know she would have appreciated the sister uh, institution recognition here at Harvard. The significance of Ruth Shellhorn's landscape designs is embodied in the spirit of the post-World War II Southern California lifestyle with its emphasis on outdoor living and individuality. Mid-century Southern California would become a major center of development and creativity during the course of her career. The temperate climate and the geographic diversity of the region, along with larger social, cultural, economic, and political factors of the times, influenced her work, as did a widespread philosophical shift from formalism to new ideas that were responsive to this new era. Shellhorn began her career in the early 19. Wait. Shellhorn began her career in the early 1930s during the deprivations of America's Great Depression, and she ended her practice with a gradual retirement just shortly after the 1973 oil crisis. These were culturally defining bookends of restriction and pessimism, beginning with the gloom of limited opportunities and ending with the shocking realization of limited resources. But the bulk of Shellhorn's work occurred during those intervening years of buoyancy and optimism, the nationwide post-World War II boom. This period of rising confidence was characterized by an exploding population, unprecedented economic growth, and the rise of the largest middle class of the 20th century. Americans were busy finding jobs, raising families, pursuing a college education made easily available through the GI Bill, and otherwise improving themselves to take advantage of a dynamic and upwardly mobile economic environment. In all walks of life, they were able to realistically aspire to the idea of a single family home with a backyard and a garden. Many of them moved to Southern California to realize their aspirations, and this made the region a kind of prism for America's newfound prosperity. Um, just so you know, this is Gene Autry's backyard. That's his wife, and uh, Ina Mae Spivey. For those of you who are so young, you can't remember, he was an uh, actor and country western singer. <laughs> the Southern California economy was buoyed by an expansion in engineering and aerospace manufacturing, an increase in banking and financial services, and a growing agricultural empire. This was not the coal mines of Appalachia or the steel factories of the Northeast. 
This was the land of promise, of dreams, of winter orange groves laden with fruit. And this was the land of plenty, or so it seemed at the time. An abundant source of water flowed from Owens Lake after 1913. President Roosevelt's New Deal funded construction of major public works projects, including Hoover Dam, which supplied the Southland with cheap and plentiful electricity. Following the water and electricity, there came a prevailing belief in the unrestricted use of limitless natural resources. This perspective of plenty would have a profound effect on Shellhorn's landscape designs and landscape architecture in general, as would the decline of those beliefs in the latter half of the 20th century. The local television and motion picture industry also had an especially significant creative, uh, creative and economic impact in shaping the landscape of Southern California. Associated with post-World War II prosperity, this landscape might not have been possible if the people who created it had not been steadily employed in one of the few industries that prospered during the Depression years. The industry exerted a cushioning influence on the building professions, first by providing a career haven for otherwise out-of-work architects and landscape architects in the design and construction of movie sets, and second by creating the ripple effects of that economy, which were discernible throughout the Southland during and after the war. It wasn't just the money available to studio executives and movie stars to indulge in constructing the mansions and garden estates of their dreams. It was the dreams themselves. Images emanating from these celluloid landscapes exerted their own influence in shaping regional identity for Southern California, and they were often rooted in the very fantasies that were played out on the big screen. Nowhere was the presence of the automobile more prevalent. Dominant patterns of far-flung suburban development emerged and landscape architecture responded to the demands of the Southern California automobile culture. This was perfectly symbolized in the coming together of outdoor living and individual freedom, a top-down convertible cruising along the open highway. By the time Shellhorn closed her office in 1990, the region was crisscrossed with Eisenhower-era interstate highways leading to suburbs, theme parks, universities, and mega shopping centers. All of these developing genres bore the imprint of her empathic design artistry. This high energy environment of pursuit, progress, mobility, and individualism took place in an era and in a region where the outdoors and our relation to it was becoming a matter of utmost importance. Where we lived, where we had recreation, where we shopped, where we went to school, the outdoors mattered. The exuberance and optimism and freedom and consumerism of emerging Southern California lifestyle were expressed in the context of the out of doors. The presence of a mild Mediterranean climate made this way of life possible on a year round basis. Cool, wet winters and warm, dry summers offered the always present opportunity to swim and surf in the Pacific Ocean, just a two hour drive from hiking in the San Bernardino Mountains or stargazing in the Palm Springs Desert. The opportunity for outdoor living then contributed its own distinctive influence in the emerging urban landscape. Shellhorn interpreted the total ensemble of these influences through her landscape designs. These were a lush, modern expression of landscape design. They evoked the zeitgeist of a sun-soaked, leisurely lifestyle, and they became closely associated with the development of the Southern California look of mid-century architecture and landscape architecture. Shellhorn viewed her role of landscape architect as a provider of natural respite amidst this salubrious, high-energy environment. She believed that landscape architecture in its purest sense is an art, and she was committed to bringing the emotional and psychological power of that art to everyday life. Of the more well-known modernist landscape architects practicing in the mid-century era, Shellhorn's work is perhaps best understood in the same milieu as that of Thomas Church. Shellhorn would become more well known for her public landscapes and Church for his private gardens, but like Church, Shellhorn developed her practice around a client-centered philosophy. She cared about how people would live, work, and play in the outdoor spaces she designed. Whether working on a large-scale public project or the tiniest of gardens, she approached each design with the idea that her clients should feel, above all else, acknowledged, inspired, and restored. Ralph Cornell referred to Ruth Shellhorn as a landscape architect's landscape architect. By this, he meant that she was the landscape architect her peers would seek out when they were in need of a landscape architect. He was also referring to her ability to execute equally exceptional work in an unusually wide spectrum of projects. These ranged in scope and style from the most finely detailed garden, 
like the entry steps to this Pasadena estate by the modern architect A. Quincy Jones, to major planning projects like the Shoreline Development Study. This study represented the other end of the spectrum in terms of Shellhorn's scope of work, and it was groundbreaking for a number of reasons. First, it was commissioned by a private group of businessmen to analyze and make comprehensive recommendations for improving a 12-mile stretch of public coastal area. This was done at a time when public-private partnerships of this kind were not commonplace. And to the extent that these partnerships did occur, they tended to focus on much smaller commercial-type projects than did Shell, uh, Shoreline. Second, Shoreline issued then prescient recommendations for political and social action that has come to pass. It tackled restrictions on oil drilling in Santa Monica Bay. It set a precedent for many of the goals of the later enacted California Coastal Act. It advocated the use of public funding for recreation and parkland acquisition, and it paved the way for installation of Los Angeles's first sewage treatment plant. Shellhorn's involvement in this study helped ensure its publication. Because of her contribution, we now have the record of an early planning document that began to address modern principles of balance between coastal preservation and development. A continuous thread of residential garden and estate work also ran alongside Shellhorn's planning, commercial, recreation, and campus projects. In this genre, she demonstrated a stylistic versatility inspired by her commitment to serve the needs and wishes of her client. Her landscape design for the small residential garden of this 1929 Monterey colonial home in Pasadena is quite different from the modern garden she created for A. Quincy Jones, but it keeps true to the home's architecture and the neighborhood in which it is situated. Even in a traditional setting like this one, though, Shellhorn's landscape design and her choices and combinations of plants offered a casual formality that gave it a distinctive Southern California look. While the professional breadth of these projects speaks to Shellhorn's versatility, the modern elements of the Southern California look are best illustrated in the commercial landscape design she created for the Bullock's department stores and shopping centers between 1945 and 1968. Bullock's Pasadena was the first of these stores, and while each succeeding project exhibited its own individual elements and identity, the underlying template was derived from the Bullock's president's one and only directive on this first project, he wanted lush, tropical-like landscaping, and he specifically forbade the use of what he called eastern-looking plants, which there are a lot of out here today. It was here that Shellhorn began to develop the glossy-leaved, sun-splashed plant palette that came to identify all of the Bullock's department stores and the Southern California look. Bullock's Pasadena was hailed as a bellwether project when it opened in 1947. It was the first modern department store in the region to be located in the suburbs and one of the first of a genre to explicitly embrace the automobile. Everything about this new Bullock spoke to a fresh, innovative style of California living. The project architect, Welton Beckett, designed the department store to emphasize open space, horizontality, convenience, and Southern California's indoor-outdoor living ethos. He planned the three-level store to hug a gently sloping site, and he utilized a streamlined design that was informed by the same aesthetic that created the low-slung post-war automobiles that first parked there. Even his sighting of the retail structure as a building within a park setting was described as unique to the California scene. Shellhorn's landscape design echoed Beckett's architectural approach. She interpreted the development as a park-like oasis within a larger suburban landscape, introducing a cool modern palette of tropical-themed plants with complementary bold forms. It was necessary to select plants that could adapt to the hot, dry summers and cold, wet winters of the interior valley climate of Pasadena, but within those restrictions, she chose large-leaf, glossy plants to give a rich texture, and she opted for a relatively limited plant palette in keeping with the size and simplicity of the store. Together, Beckett's and Shellhorn's visual style expressed a modern spirit that caught the optimism of the times. Part of that spirit was found in Shellhorn's acknowledgement of the importance of destination for newly mobile shoppers. Site design that integrated the automobile was not a new idea in 1945. The arrival of the Model T Ford in the early 1900s had made automobiles affordable to ordinary Americans, and pioneering landscape architects such as Lockwood DeForest III had responded during the past two decades by creating thoughtful design solutions to incorporate graceful accommodation for these new necessities. 
Shellhorn took this responsiveness a step further, conceiving of the ideal shopping experience as a progression, one that began even before the store itself came into view, and one that was capable of building up a level of excitement and anticipation as the automobile approached and entered the property. To this end, she used tall vertical elements such as a trio of Washington palms or a drift of airy eucalyptus trees to create a skyline and beckon customers in their cars from several blocks away. The consideration of automobile storage was an inevitable component in the development of the Southern California look. Shellhorn viewed parking areas as an opportunity to provide an oasis, a relief from the necessity of acres of asphalt, concrete, and the glinting metal of the cars that parked there. At Bullock Santa Ana, she accomplished this by giving shade and three season interest to these areas with the summer yellow flowers and uh, pumpkin colored fall capsules of Chinese flame trees. And she planted show stopping drifts of profusely flowering Cape chestnut trees in closely spaced planting islands, which pleasantly distracted the driver from the task at hand. In smaller areas, she placed lush landscaping with bright shots of color around spatially generous entrances to announce the automobile's arrival. Whatever the size of the project, the customer's first view of the property when she turned in from the street was a, of a carefully composed scene that said welcome. The attention that she gave to these parking areas is a remnant of a now bygone era, as I think most of you who shop at Costco know. Shellhorn next turned her attention to the details of pedestrian transition from parking area to store entrance. Each turn of directions or set of steps presented an opportunity to compose a scene, not just a planter filled with plants, but a picture composed like a classical painting, balanced with a hierarchical element, arrangement of elements, and a discernible foreground, middle ground, and background. This was one form of the Southern California look, a modern expression of traditional principles. This expression applied to other elements from the formal tradition as well. When working with a small amount of planting space, for example, she experimented with espaliers, and her twining kangaroo vine introduced a modern informality that took the form of an abstract sculpture. It was this attention to detail that elevated the quality of Shellhorn's Southern California look. During construction, she had the authority to box and save existing trees with special character. Her precisely supervised pruning brought out the contorted branching structure of a flowering pear. This particular use of the tree was a fresh glance back at the ancient art of bonsai, and it became the focal point of a sensational composition at a high traffic store entrance. Bullock's management was consciously committed to the merchandising idea of creating a home away from home. This perfectly meshed with Shellhorn's own philosophy that people feel engaged and acknowledged. She had a very well-defined sense of scale, which enabled her to create that intimate but hard to achieve relationship between public spaces and the visitors who inhabited them. People who shopped in her commercial shopping centers or promenaded along Disneyland's Main Street or strolled across her campuses intuitively felt that these places were just right. Another tenet of Bullock's management made the distinction between buying and shopping, reasoning that we buy our necessities like a loaf of bread, but we shop for the things that we want. All of the Bullock's enterprises sold only high-end clothing and home furnishings, and they wanted to entice their customers to stay, to linger, and to shop. Shellhorn's lush, expansive park-like landscape design subtly controlled views of storefronts, screened unsightly views from outside the property, provided shade and seating, and did all these things while making the customer feel as though she were on a vacation. For many years, these shopping centers were not open on Sundays, but people came down anyway to have picnics, take their wedding pictures, and paint pictures. Department stores notoriously require a vast amount of interior display space, which usually results in a rather blocky windowless facade. Combined with their height and bulk, the structures can dwarf a pedestrian. Shellhorn gave enormous attention to ameliorating this aspect of each Bullock's plan. She began with trees that gave a light feathery silhouette and introduced the use of lawn, a then new concept in shopping center design, because she liked the visually suggested invitation to relax.
Under Shellhorn's direction, the tight spaces between parking garage and store, even the most mundane passageways, became beautiful garden qu courtyards of enclosed space. Walking through this, this space directed a variety of views. Paving was selected to create a pleasing movement and curbing added a detail of definition. Textured compositions of bold leaves contrasted with linear strap leaf foliage. A seat to search for one's keys provided an additional thoughtful touch. This was a rich composition that said Ruth Shellhorn. By March of 1955, Shellhorn and Welton Beckett had worked together on almost a dozen projects. It is with his modern style that many of Shellhorn's own landscape designs became noticed and noted. The two had a deep respect and admiration for each other's abilities. Beckett also had a close relationship with Walt Disney. He knew that Walt Disney was struggling with the uncoordinated plans and construction deadlines as his workmen raced to finish Disneyland in time for opening day on July 17th. With less than four months to go, Disney turned to Beckett for a recommendation for someone to help his design team. Beckett recommended only Shellhorn. Construction had been underway for about a year when Shellhorn began to take a look at what additional design work would, need, would be needed to open the park on time. Art directors were in charge of each of the five separate lands, but there was no plan to link the different areas of the park, and Disney was worried that it would not hang together. Shellhorn saw immediately what was needed, and she worked seven days a week those last few months to complete the final designs for the town square, Main Street, and Plaza Hub. She also designed the pedestrian plan for the entire park, worked out planting plans with Jack and Bill Evans, coordinated engineering plans, and supervised the digging out of the moat and the planting around Sleeping Beauty's castle. In spite of the conditions of construction, she put a high value on personal dignity, and she always came to the site wearing a skirt. And that's her, way in the background. To comprehend Shellhorn's contribution to Disneyland, we need for just a moment to go beyond a discussion of the design of Disneyland and look to the phenomenon of Disneyland as well. We need to remember how we perceived our notions of collective social happiness. Shellhorn's landscape designs admittedly expressed the positive side of a post-war life that had also a darker form. World War II veterans dealt with their symptoms of what was then called shell shock by escaping into alcoholism. Racism and race riots tore the country apart over needed civil rights, such as school desegregation. McCarthyism introduced a new level of social fear and an extraordinary waste of talent. Shellhorn's landscape designs didn't acknowledge or deal with any of these social problems, nor were they meant to. Walt Disney wanted to invite park visitors to shed reality momentarily and take a psychological vacation. He intentionally turned to a rosy, nostalgic look at America's past to provide an escape from the uglier and more difficult aspects of post-war life. And as a father himself, Disney wanted to provide this fantasy environment for families, a place where parents could spend leisure time with their children. McCall's magazine had recently coined the term togetherness to identify this very notion. In 1955, this was a new idea. Shellhorn understood Disney's conception. While thousands of talented people were responsible for creating Disneyland, she brought to Disneyland those same planning patterns of her Southern California look, which she had developed during the early Bullock's years. These patterns considered the seamless movement of people from one place to another. They incorporated the appropriate use of scale, and they introduced the design of details to enhance the quality of a space. Along with her people-oriented design philosophy and familiarity with a wide range of planting materials, she was able to contribute extraordinary competence and organizing skill in a wildly imaginative context. Disney appreciated Shellhorn as the perfect choice for the job. How to efficiently move people to and through the site was one of the most important requirements in Shellhorn's pedestrian plan. Walt Disney wanted to provide a nostalgic look back at old time America, but in order to handle large squares, the town square had to be much larger than a typical town square. The 1890s architecture, railway station, and little trains were detailed at 5 8 scale to help diminish the perception of a big space. Shellhorn was determined to keep that level of care evident in the landscape design. When Disney impulsively decided during construction that he wanted to add a bandstand to the town square, Shellhorn protested. 
She said it was too big. She said it overpowered the railway station and everything around it. She said it was out of proportion with the square, and she said it interfered with the axial view around, uh, between the railway station and the castle. She really didn't want that bandstand. <laughs> Halfway through construction, Disney came back to take a look, decided he agreed with Shellhorn, and ordered the bandstand out. They moved it to another area, and Shellhorn replaced, it, replaced the bandstand with a slender flagpole. Disney learned to trust Shellhorn's judgment in these matters, and she said there were no further incidents. <laughs> Once the bandstand was removed, Shellhorn created smaller, more intimate niches and pedestrian pockets within the larger open space. She set benches in from the sidewalks to create a peaceful retreat from the exciting sights and activities beckoning guests into the park. The park visitor was able to orient himself along the major access leading to the castle, yet still enjoy a small-scale sense of discovery while moving from the town square to Main Street. The flagpole, along with red-colored paving and bedding plants in colors of red, white, and blue, contributed, contributed to the patriotic theme envisaged by Disney. Neat green lawns and a cannon completed this scene of small town America. The most striking evidence of Shellhorn's skill is to be seen in her planting design for the Plaza Hub Garden. Walt Disney wanted Disneyland to evoke an eternal spring. I just want you all to note that this photo was taken in a January. <laughs> Given the context in which Disneyland was created, this was not such a far-fetched idea. But from a practical standpoint, Shellhorn's task was daunting. She was to unify the dissimilar geographical and ecological environments represented by the entrances to a dry and dusty western frontier land, the tropical jungle of adventure land, a past vision of childhood and fantasy land, and a predictive glimpse into the future of Tomorrowland. This was not an easy thing to do. Shellhorn unified these vignettes through a repetitive but highly inventive use of plant materials. A melaleuca, with its peeling bark and tiny leaves, for example, was featured in the entrance landscape to Frontierland, but the same species of trees also cast its contorted, evil queen spell over the entrance to Sleeping Beauty's castle. A descendant of this tree still casts its spell at Disneyland, which brings me to the final point I want to bring up during this talk. Landscape architects create their designs with the understanding that these tend to be transitory in nature. Our work is subject to the entropy factor, and more susceptible to neglect, perhaps more than any of the other visual arts. Plants grow old and die. Remodels, teardowns, and adaptive reuse all compromise the ability of an original landscape to endure. Many examples of mid-century landscape design are disappearing, and only a few of Shellhorn's own remain with us today. All of the Bullock stores have gone through additional generations of change or have been replaced altogether. There is a smattering of private homes and one or two large projects where her installations can still be discerned and appreciated. It is a rather strange twist of fate, then, that we have the commercial fantasy-based landscape designs of Disneyland to thank for providing us with the most enduring and vivid remaining example of her public oeuvre. Current design and maintenance staff there have deliberately preserved a recognizable portion of her landscape design, although that, too, is now diminishing. The record of Shellhorn's contribution is largely, therefore, an archival record of her professional papers and a large collection of photographs. Shortly before her death in November 2006, she agreed with much urging to donate her landscape architectural collection and drawings and papers to the Department of Special Collections at UCLA. Those papers are in the midst of processing as we speak. I do not believe that she had the foresight to envision the tremendous value her life habit would confer on the historical landscape architectural community, but I see us as the beneficiaries nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm struck by how banal m much of the cult, uh, cr uh, current commercial landscape is compared to what Ruth Shellhorn was doing. Um, do people have questions either for Kelly or for Sonia? We have a few minutes for questions before we take a break. I have a question for Kelly, which is um, the, the um, hub and spoke arrangement, was that Ruth Shellhorn's idea for Disneyland or was that a given that she then modified and... Uh, can I speak? Yeah, please. Because that became the standard for Disney's theme parks, the hub and spoke, no, she Main did Street. Not, she, 
she, she did not design the hub and spoke. That the basic contours of it were already laid out on the ground, mm -hmm. and and in fact, all the different lands were being in the middle of construction, different things. Although they ended up moving a lot of, right. over, as time went on, but that was the basic. Plan. So what she did was refine it and adjust the landscape to mm -hmm. fit the scale and and. Yeah. The, I mean, in the simplest form, what she did is she widened and shortened and lengthened a lot of planting areas to create all of the pedestrian access. Right. And then, you know, directing views and, um, uh, and screening views as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Great. Question for Kelly. Um, I think I heard you say Cape Chestnut Tree. Is that what you said? Yes. What? Calodendron Cape Hence. I'm sorry? Calodendron Cape Hence. Ooh. I, I think, but I'm maybe making that I don't have my sunset book with me, but... <laughs> I thought it looked like Lagastrovia. Well, it, you know, in bloom they are similar, but the Cape chestnut trees are much larger. And, and if you notice how, how, what a big umbrella they put over those trees, and, and the Lagastrovia really are a little too small for... She wouldn't have used those there because they don't have the height and majesty that she would have wanted. I don't. We have a guest here we'll from Google China. Break. We can Google it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thaisa, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question from China that I always needed to ask you. Um, well, that was asking for a question. Uh -huh. <laughs> when, when I talked about the history of the Bush Street architecture, I talked about the ones in England, those are the ones that we have. I'm curious whether the history um, of landscape architecture in Germany, Italy, whether they Um, I, I, do you mean the written histories, uh, like, and what what comes up in textbooks? Is that yeah? Um, well, I think one of the um, difficulties in the European uh, countries is that there are no textbooks, and <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a real problem, um, and uh, or if. Well, I mean, there, I think in, at least I can probably speak for Germany and Italy. I don't know of a textbook that's as comprehensive as, let's say, Elizabeth Barlow Rogers. Was, yeah. um, so, you know, I guess that's, that's part of the answer. Um, there have been, um, there has been a study of uh, female architects and also female landscape architects, but only reaching up to, um, in both cases, I think predominantly the um, pre-war, uh, so pre-Second World War, uh, and not so much focusing on the second half of the 20th century, so not so recent. Um, so it's a, it's a similar issue, I think. Um, I guess, you know, the um, uh, individual texts and readings and things, you know, if I, if I think back to my school days, well, we didn't have any reading lists, but this is a, you know, this is <laughs> a, a, pro a huge problem. Um, and, um, but, um, I mean, th there are obviously books that cover certain periods or certain aspects, um, but also the question is how critical are they? And so I think, you know, um, th there's um, a lack of material and there's a lacuna, yeah, I would say. Is there one other question? Yeah. It, yeah, it was very, so the three women I, I um, uh, showed you, they were all at that conference and they were influenced, I mean definitely influenced and I think on two occasions I tried to kind of bring that in um, by that conference. Yeah, thanks. All right, should we take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll resume?